I think I never got over the pocket chip. That ad where the girl takes the pocket chip with her to code outside on what looks like a sunny late summer evening. There is this promise here of free, effortless, on-the-go creativity. It's intoxicating. I've been chasing this high ever since without really being able to put my finger on what it is that I'm actually looking for. And so here we are now. Will the deaf term fulfill that pocket chip fantasy? Let's find out. Hi everybody, I'm Christian and this is Lazy Devs and today I will be looking at the dev term, the Clockwork Pi dev term from the perspective of a fantasy console developer. The dev term is a portable Linux computer with a weird screen and plenty of retro vibes. It is the second device by Clockwork Pi after the game shell. My impressions of the game shell were a bit mixed, so I initially dismissed the dev term when it was first announced. It seemed like another expensive toy for, well, you know, it, not for me. It seemed like something for people who are into Linux, like really into Linux. But then I've seen some other devs running Pico 8 on it and... Awaken to that hunger inside. Quick disclaimer, my device is a review unit sent to me by the manufacturer on my request. I have not received any monetary compensation for this video and the manufacturer did not have any monetary control over the video. In fact, they haven't even seen it before I released it here on YouTube. Okay, so like every review of this thing, I guess I need to give lip service to the part where the dev term comes in pieces and you need to build it yourself. So here we go. The huge box comes with two large plastic trays of plastic parts and electronic components. Like with a game shell, they all snap together quickly and without any advanced techniques like soldering. So yeah, this thing is basically a portable computer Gundam. The technical term is Gunpla. And perhaps it feels a bit more justified here than it was with a game shell. After all, I actually had a genuine reason to open it up later to replace a part, but more on that later. When it's all assembled, what you get is essentially a tiny proto notebook with a small but crazy wide screen. It superficially resembles the early laptop precursors like the TRS-80 Model 100, except these computers were built around a regular full-sized keyboard. The dev term is more compact. It has a custom keyboard with tiny keys that are the perfect match for the miniature hands of my two and a half year old daughter. But with my adult sausage fingers, it makes me feel a little bit like <laughs> On the other hand, the dev term is bigger than the pocket chip I've mentioned before. In fact, I might be actually totally wrong drawing comparisons between the two. They are physically just such different devices. The pocket chip wowed me with a Game Boy-like form factor. It was a computer you could slide in your jeans pocket. The dev term won't fit in there no matter how hard you try. In fact, the dev term doesn't really fit anywhere particularly well. Despite the miniaturized keyboard, it doesn't feel as portable as it looks because it's super thick and chunky. It has like volume. It takes space in your backpack. And I think part of the issue is the build quality. See, the Model 100 was a tank built in the 80s. I bet it was probably designed to keep functioning even in case of nuclear disaster of the Cold War or something. And so if the Model 100 was a tank, the dev term is a plastic scale model of that tank. It's smaller, made out of fragile plastic. It creaks, parts bend under pressure. There are basically no screws. It is held together by latches, the two knobs on the side and warm thoughts. The backside of it is essentially a flimsy plastic cheese grater. You can easily poke a long nail into the large ventilation gaps and touch the components. The battery flap on this thing is horrible. It falls out at every opportunity, sometimes even ejecting the batteries in the process. Whoop, it fell out again, surprise. I have to fish this thing out from my backpack every single time. And the thing is, it's not even a particularly sleek plastic model. Don't get me wrong, it looks sick on the photos and renderings, but the impressions just don't quite hold up when you have it in your hand. The plastic feels rough and plain. It doesn't quite have that gorgeous, glossy Lego quality of the game shell. Even the print on the front is blurry, like the edges are a little bit soft, like you would see on something that would be much cheaper. It's weird. I remember Game Shell as an exceptionally sturdy and sleek device. The dev term feels like they had to scale down their production budget, or maybe it's a supply chain issue, or maybe they had to make concession because of its size. 
I don't know, be it as it may, it's neither sturdy nor luxurious enough to justify the fragility. It demands a protective case. I feel nervous putting it in my backpack unprotected. And there's more that doesn't quite line up, like check this out, there are no rubber feet at the bottom, just like these small plastic pegs. So the whole thing skitters around on any flat surface like an air hockey puck. Okay, to be fair, this is a glass table, but I had the same issue on a wooden desk. I didn't really want to mod my unit before I'm finished with this review, but it was just impossible to keep using it in its vanilla state. I almost immediately had to get some Suguru and made little feetsies for it. How this blunder got shipped unaddressed is a bit puzzling to me. Seems like something like that would have been quickly picked up with any basic user testing, right? So overall, so far a bunch of odd and irritating nitpicks, but also nothing major, no real showstoppers. And I'm kind of stalling here because I need to talk about the keyboard. <sighs> This is an incredibly difficult subject to cover simply because there are so many different levels of expectations that people have. It makes a huge difference if you are a mechanic keyboard freak who hand loops their key switches or if you are some kind of philistine savage who thought Apple's butterfly switches were just fine. A friend of mine used to hinge the purchase of an entire 2000 euro plus notebook on whether the outer bottom left key on the keyboard was FN or control. It would drive him crazy if it was FN. And I totally get it. I own two mechanical keyboards. I even swapped the switches on one of them because I didn't quite like the feel. A keyboard can be this deeply personal item. It's the thing you touch to communicate with the computer and with the little people living inside of your computer. So this is by definition a touchy subject. So it is not going to be possible for me to cover this subject in a way that accounts for everybody's preferences and expectations. All I can do is just to talk about my experience and give you my personal opinion and it's going to be up to you to decide what that means for you. With that out of the way, here is the bottom line. The keyboard on the dev term is fine. I'm not saying there's no problems with it. And of course, it's slower than a regular keyboard. And of course, it's less comfortable than a regular keyboard. But after a month of using it, my general impression is that for most of the things I needed it for, it was fine. Let's get some perspective here. Let's look at a keyboard that is not fine. Let's look at a keyboard of the pocket chip. Yes, as much as I stand, I fully admit one of the two major flaws of the pocket chip is the keyboard. The small form factor only really allows for thumb typing. No, 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 I mean thumb typing. The metal dome buttons require an unreasonable amount of pressure. Typing anything is excruciatingly slow. Your brain is constantly occupied solving a little physics puzzle about what grip to use so your fingers can summon the necessary leverage to collapse the next metal dome. You are not typing words, you are punching individual letters, one letter at a time. There is a real effort here that changes the way you write. You plan ahead to minimize the struggle. You keep things brief. Typing on it becomes the choke point that the things that you need to do have to be awkwardly pushed through. You don't use the keyboard, you manage the keyboard. It becomes a problem to solve. Yes, the keyboard on a pocket chip is not fine. So in a grand scheme of things, if we have looped mechanical switches nirvana on one side and metal dome thumb typing hell on the other side, most keyboards will sit right in a boring and plain center. Just doing their job, sometimes flawed, but not in a way that becomes a problem that comes to dominate your work. And to me the dev term keyboard is hanging out somewhere in this area as well. Sure, it's a bit awkward at first, but I got used to it quickly and kind of forgot about it. It's fine. <sighs> okay, so now that we got this out in the open, I still feel the need to point out a couple of small issues. You know, full transparency and all. Uh, the large keys experience something that the keyboard community calls binding. I actually had to look this up. Uh, this means hitting them off center will sometimes make the key tilt and jam, so it becomes harder to press. And when that happens, you need to like push through with more force, which doesn't feel nice, or you need to repress uh, more centered. People on the forums try to address this with lubricant and other DUI solutions. 
And it kind of works, but there's no quick and universal fix for it yet. Also, the FN key is the outer bottom left key, and yes, it's annoying. The keyboard unit has a micro USB port, so maybe you could like reprogram it and switch FN and control. But even then you can't still switch the keycaps because they are different sizes. Grrr. Finally, I personally found the keyboard unusable in darkness. There is no illumination, not even from the screen itself since it's all flat. And the keyboard is too unusual to operate by feel alone. All right, enough of the keyboard. Let me tell you about the things that are nowhere near to being fine. This trackball here, Total garbage. The console buttons on the side, also total garbage. So the idea with the console buttons is that you could maybe hold the DevTram like a big Game Boy and play some games on it. But that just doesn't work for so many reasons. Let me count the ways. The D-pad is not one big rocker that tilts on a central pillar. It's four individual buttons. They are insanely wobbly. In fact, they continue to wobble even after they bottom out and they even have sharp edges. So usually what you want to do with D-pad like this is to kind of rub your thumb around it as you transition to the different directions. Can't do this here. Your thumb will catch on the sharp edges and drag around the buttons as you move it. And if that wasn't just a complete showstopper, the escape button just happens to be right underneath here anyway. It's impossible not to accidentally press it. It's a disaster. The face buttons are not much better. There is huge travel, there's tons of wobble and check this out. Button bottoms out and doesn't actually trigger. I need to apply pressure in the bottom out state to actually register the press. Could be maybe just a janky unit. Maybe I can open it and fix it or get a replacement. But at this point, why even bother? I'm not going to use these controller buttons ever. As for the trackball, well, let me just show you this. This is me using the trackball to go from one side of the screen to the other. Yeah, that's a long time. In fact, come closer and, and I don't know if you can hear this, but if you listen carefully while I move. Crossing the screen feels like a journey on this, and this is with all of the speed sliders set to maximum. This will maybe work in a pinch, like if you have it on your lap and you really, really need to click one button. Otherwise, basically expect to always use the dev term with a dedicated mouse. Which, to be fair, is pretty easy to do, thanks to the generous I.O. on this thing. I don't really understand why manufacturers are so skimpy on I.O. these days, like instead they're trying to outdo themselves on thin bezels or some other meaningless stupidity. Anyway, the dev term has a total of three regular USB ports. It has one USB-C port for charging, one micro HDMI for HDMI out, and a delicious 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. This lets you plug in an external mouse, a gamepad, and anything else that you will need. The ports are sometimes unusually tight, but otherwise I'm quite happy with this. Okay, so I think it's time to discuss the insides. The dev term comes in four different variants. They have an overview table on the website, and at first this didn't make much sense to me. So let me try to break this down now that I kind of understand what is happening here. So the dev term has a tiny main board and that main board has a dim slot which takes what they call a core module. The core module is essentially the actual computer and the rest of the dev term hardware is logistics. The different dev term models only differ in the kind of core module they come with. The CM3 Plus Lite module over here is the only of the four that isn't actually made by Clockwork Pi. Instead, that's a genuine Raspberry Pi module. It's not the fastest, but it's tried and tested hardware, super compatible to all of the Raspberry Pi software out there already. The remaining three core modules are all custom made by Clockwork Pi. There are two AO4 models and a super beefy AO6 top spec variant. So yeah, as you might have noticed, it slipped my mind that there are actually two uh, AO6 modules, there's the one that I tested, but there's also another one that has slightly less RAM. I can't say much about the AO4 models, they aren't out yet, but I was able to test the AO6 one. It is powered by the Rockchip 3399, which it looks like it will become the workhorse for the upcoming generation of emulation handhelds. Funny coincidence, by the way, the company making these is actually located in the town I live in. Small world. 
Anyway, I don't recommend the A06. Don't get me wrong, yes, it's super beefy for sure. Even on a modest speed setting, it was able to do all the things I needed it for. And I seen even some amazing things. Some people on the forums dabbled in PC emulation with it. I mean, the frame rates are not quite there yet, but you know, give it some time. My main issue using the AO6 was a lack of compatibility. Clockwork Pi provides an ARMBM based operating system for it. The whole architecture is ARM64, which means you aren't compatible with a regular Linux since you are on ARM architecture, and you aren't compatible with a Raspberry stuff since that's still 32-bit for the most part. This means that pretty much every software you install needs some kind of workaround or needs to be compiled from the source code. And I'm sure there are people out there for whom Linux feels so familiar and comfortable that this won't be an issue. I fully admit, I am not that person. Getting anything to run on the AO6 felt to me like that scene from The Simpsons where Sideshow Bob kept stepping on the rakes. Just a whole field of rakes to step on. I was able to find a thread with a workaround to get Pico 8 to run on it. No such luck with Tick 80 and a whole bunch of other things I wanted to try. On top of that, the AO6 had some hardware issues for me. I never managed to make it connect to my home Wi-Fi, for example. It just wasn't able to see it. Looked around the forums for a fix, but the hardware is just too obscure. Also, once you crank up the RK3399, it starts generating some serious heat, so you start to hear that little fan on the dev drum quite a lot. I initially had problems where the fan would be running even when I wasn't really doing anything complicated. Clockwork Pi eventually released this neat script they call the manual gearbox, and that essentially resolved those issues for me. But also if I run this thing throttled all the time anyway, what's even the point of all that horsepower, right? For this reason, I very quickly started to hunt for a CM3 Plus Lite module to downgrade to the Raspberry version. And let me tell you, that's not an easy thing to do in a world going through a supply chain issue. I think usually these things go for like 25 bucks, but scalpers on Taobao are now taking over 200. I finally got around this by buying this CM3 powered emulation handheld and looting it for its module. Still cheaper than paying the scalpers. Anyway, that CM3, it's great fun. It's where it's at to me. For the most part, I don't even notice the performance drop and the added compatibility is a blessing. Any software that provides a dedicated Raspberry build will run directly on it without any hassle. And most software made for Linux will typically have detailed instructions on how to get it to run on a Raspberry. There are plenty of tutorials and guides for all sorts of fun projects to try on it. Any issue I had was just a quick Google away. This is a huge deal for a Linux noob like me. And yes, the fan also stays silent, that's nice. So yes, it will run Pico 8. Yes, it will run Tick 80. Yes, it will run Doom. Yes, it will run Poom. Yes, it will run Retro Arch, although hmm, the version I got is a bit janky and you can't download cores on it, which kind of defeats the purpose. Setting the DevRAM up as an emulation device would take some serious work. Surprisingly so, I thought this was a solved problem. But hey, here's a Game Boy game. And here's a GPA game. You can make it work, but there are better devices for console emulation anyway. If you have a tiny computer, why not try something that is designed for a computer? So here is Open Transport Tycoon. It's easy to set up and it takes full advantage of the entire screen. Mm. And here is Open XCOM. Jeez, I could easily see myself sinking some good hours into this. A fun thing to do is to install the software called Cool Retro Term. 
it wasn't actually specifically created for the dev term, I think, but I've, it feels like it was made for it. It adds fancy, customizable CRT shaders to the terminal window. Go full screen and boom, instant retro vibes. I think this may be my favorite way I found so far to play text adventures like Zork. Explore the classics. Or you can get into roguelikes, and I mean the OG roguelikes, like here is NetHack. WTF, how is this even a roguelike? This is just some text. This looks nothing like Hollow Knight. <laughs> Not today, Satan. Personally, I'd really love to run a terminal-based text editor like Nano in here and just give me like a distraction-free cyberpunk text editor. That's how I wrote the script to this video and it feels good. It feels like what this device was made for. Hack the planet. Hack the planet! Pico 8 running at full tilt will use up around half of the CM3's CPU power. By the way, this was the second major flow of the pocket chip. It wasn't quite able to run Pico 8 at full speed. But here you have enough brain power to do that and even open a browser and load up a website or two. Just don't expect to be doing too much serious browsing with it. For one, with only one gigabyte of RAM on the CM3, things will slow down eventually. And yeah, like ads can basically shut down your entire system for a couple of seconds. But really the main issue that tempers the browsing experience is just the low vertical resolution. Let's talk about the screen because this thing is odd. So it is 1280 pixels wide, but only 480 pixels tall. It may be an odd thing to say, but despite the small physical size, it almost feels like a multi-monitor setup. So most of the software you open will be limited by the height. You almost always end up with part of your screen free to use. It essentially invites you to use two windows next to each other all the time. And that's cool. So you can have a Pico 8 window and a terminal or a Pico 8 window and VS Code. Shout out to a friend and supporter of the show, Kevin Thompson, for his super useful tutorial on how to use Pico 8 with an external code editor. I personally found myself just using Pico 8 and having a browser window open for things like the manual or, you know, just a terminal window. It was also sometimes nice to open two Pico 8 windows to copy code between cards. This is where the DevTerm really shines as a productivity-focused portable computer. The downside is that the screen is small. I managed only to scale the Pico 8 window pixel perfect and it ends up physically smaller than on the Game Force or the Pocket Chip. It's still readable just fine, but I know some of you out there will want to use an external code editor to maximize readability. Tick 80 looks a bit more comfortable. It takes better advantage of the horizontal space and uses a bigger system font. The low vertical resolution impedes some everyday tasks. As already mentioned, websites look as if you're looking at them through a mailbox slot. Doing any kind of graphic work seems out of the question. It does run GIMP, but that UI doesn't really look like it's happy with a lack of space. But most importantly, a lot of the Debian windows aren't designed for a screen of this size. You constantly encounter windows where the confirm button will be off screen. You need to do the awkward alt space and move the window up just so we can click on the button. Ugh. Also, the screen quality of the panel is just average. The colors feel a bit cool and muted. It's not the kind of laminated panel you've come to expect from high-end devices. I've even encountered some screen tearing, especially on the AO6 core module. Weird vertical screen tearing too, since apparently the screen module is installed sideways and the whole OS is rotated by 90 degrees to compensate. Wild! The CM3 module has some of that too, but overall seems to do a slightly better job at running the screen. So that's just one more reason to get the Raspberry version. The HDMI out is currently only theoretical, in that it theoretically works. If you do get the right kind of cable, you can get a glimpse of the dev term outputting some console log during boot up. And that's it. There is a screen configuration tool, but there is nothing to do here. Maybe it's a matter of installing some software or adjusting some configuration. This is something that should have been working out of the box, and it's not. Lame. 
Let's talk power. The dev term is powered by two 18650 cells. I run it with a 3500 milliampere cells from XTAR. With a CM3 core module, they last for about five and a half hours with Pico 8 running at full tilt all the time. The A06, one hour less at a comparable throttle level. The batteries are not included, so make sure to keep that in mind when calculating the bottom line price of the system. The use of off-the-shelf cells is nice, since if you need to extend battery life, you can always bring spare ones. Clockwork Pi even says that the way these are wired means that you can technically run the whole device off of only one cell. So theoretically, you can swap the cells with the device still running. In reality, if my battery cells are going out anyway, I'd be quite nervous trying that kind of stunt without saving my work first, which means I could potentially just like, you know, power down the whole unit and swap the cells like a normal human being. When plugged in with USB-C, the dev term will charge its batteries. I have to spell this out because there is no way to know. There is no indicator on it telling you it's happening or when it's finished. Well, there is a yellow light that lights up during charging, but it only works when the device is on, which kind of defeats the purpose. The game show had similar problems, weird that Clockwork Pi can't seem to be able to figure this one out. Here's something interesting. Against all my expectations, I found it was totally possible to use DevTerm in handheld mode. The device has this staircase design on the backplate, which offers a more favorable angle when on a flat surface, but it also allows the DevTerm to rest on your fingers when you hold it in your hand. The keyboard is a bit too wide, even for my gigantic hands, so those keys in the middle, I find myself reaching a little bit. And at the weight of 620 grams, you won't be using it like this for hours on end. But also I've been totally able to just idly thumb out a few lines of code on a couch. I'd even say it was a bit better than a pocket chip despite the added size and weight. The thing that really holds it back from being a couch device is a lack of any kind of sleep mode. You can't just pick it up, hit a button and jump right in where you left off. You need to boot it up and shut it down every time. or you leave it on the whole time, like some kind of savage. And none of this feels right for that kind of use. All right, let's wrap this up with the really far out hardware feature. But for that, let me rant about something that bugs me. I don't understand Clockworks Pi concept of DIY. They advertise all their devices as being DIY and, you know, hacker friendly, but the way they implement this makes me wonder what kind of person are these features even designed for? For the dev term, the idea is that the main board is essentially split in half. You have the main board with a core unit, and then you have an external board with some additional functionality. I think the idea is that the supposed hacker is meant to swap the external board for their own creations, for their own external boards. And that just kind of baffles me. What kind of person prints their own circuit boards to spec with some kind of weird proprietary connectors just for fun? Seems like at the point where you are printing your own circuit board, you actually need to know exactly what you're doing then you are no longer experimenting, right? And what's even weirder is that the default external board does have some like essential components like the fan. So if that hacker has like something that generates a lot of heat, like the AO6 core module, are they meant to also always install a fan on their custom printed DIY circuit boards? Or what's the deal here? I don't want to beat a dead horse, but the pocket chip? The pocket chip had a bunch of exposed GPIO ports at the top, and you could just poke a wire in there and start experimenting. That seems a lot more in touch with what I understand as DIY and hacker friendly, but maybe I'm just built different. So for now, all this DIY is highly speculative, and most people will be stuck with the one default external board the dev term comes with. But that one board 
is actually a lot more fun than I expected. So they put a tiny thermal printer on it. So the way this works is you take a thermal paper roll, this is a standard size, and you put it into this plastic shell. And that thing plugs into a port on the back. And then you can just use the default print commands from the operating system to print stuff on it. The process is very slow, not even close to the speed of, you know, like a cash register. Portable thermal printers are actually quite popular here in China. So I went on a shopping spree and bought a bunch of different creative thermal papers to play around with. Look, there's blue paper. And look, there's pink paper. And it even prints on self-adhesive papers too. The dev term essentially becomes a portable guerrilla marketing station. There is no specific practical application for the printer, but its existence makes you think of new things to try with it. It makes you think of ways to integrate it into your process. I was caught off guard by how much fun I had with it, and it does turn the dev term into something more unique and exciting than just another computer. I would love to see more external modules from Clockwork Pi, but seeing how little they took advantage of the modularity of the game shell, I don't have my hopes up. On the other hand, if the printer module stays the only external module, I'd be okay with that too. One thing to watch out for is that the dev term has a tendency to just randomly shut down during printing. You can see it happening to me during recording here. I'm pretty sure it's due to the batteries sometimes not being able to handle the power load. Hard to reproduce, depends on the battery's charge level, core unit, throttle. That part does not spark joy. Be careful when printing and generally save often. As I said, I've been using the dev term as my daily driver for over a month and it was fun. It was fun making it work for the things I needed to do. It worked well for PQ8 development. It seems to be a good match for that kind of cozy and restricted development environment. Against all odds, it worked quite well for a dedicated writing device. I did enjoy the focused and low distraction environment. So do I recommend the dev term? It's a question I have been grappling with. As I'm writing this, the dev term is actually not even in stock. So you can't even have it. They say they will start taking orders immediately after the pre-orders for the AO4 units have shipped. The Raspberry version is listed at $219, but with the current shortages, this version will not be in stock for a while. You could basically get an empty dev term and put in the legwork to get hold of a CM3 module like I did, but then you would be probably closer to the price of the AO6 module at $319. Plus you also need some batteries and a mouse. This kind of budget gets you a lot of computer these days. If you just want a cheap standalone computer for cozy coding, a Raspberry Pi 400 is a popular choice these days. A hundred bucks gets you a full-sized keyboard with a computer built right into it. And you even get a mouse. And if you want this portable, you can get a USB-C power bank and a portable external monitor. And boom, you are coding on the go. But of course, that's not an elegant solution. So you could also get an enclosure for it like this, but then you kind of build a laptop. So if we're here, then why not just get a cute tiny laptop? There are many Chinese manufacturers offering these ultra portable Windows laptops. This one is from a company called Top Hop Taposh. The lowest spec version seems to go for just over 200 bucks. I, I don't own it, I never used it. I suspect it's rubbish in some way, but it's probably enough for fantasy consoles, light emulation and whatever you'll use the dev term for, right? And you'll get a more portable clamshell design and a bigger screen. But if getting a notebook of AliExpress is too dodgy for you, here, a Microsoft Surface Duo 3 starts at just $399. To be fair, you also need a keyboard and they kind of hide that from you and it's kind of expensive, but that's still kind of in the price category of a top spec dev term and you get a way more comfortable keyboard, a way better screen, tablet capabilities, full Windows support, better portability, better battery life, just a whole lot more computer. Yes, the dev term succeeds in many areas where the pocket chip fell short, but here at the price, the old pocket chip has one last ace up its sleeve. At just $49, the pocket chip was just a completely different class of purchase, a simpler, more straightforward decision. The pricing of the dev term pits it against a whole range of devices where it doesn't always come up on top. So this gets to the core of the conversation and why I've mentioned that pocket chip ad at the beginning. On paper, there's a whole bunch of reasonable alternatives to the dev term. So if you are interested in it, you really need to ask yourself why? 
What is it that the dev term is giving you that a small notebook doesn't have? What exactly are you chasing here? What exactly am I chasing? Okay, so there's this community on the web that recently caught my eye. They are DIY enthusiasts building what they call cyber decks. Typically, they basically stick some kind of raspberry into a mechanical keyboard and hot glue a way too small monitor onto it, add a bunch of rechargeable cells from a discarded power bank to get yourself a computer that looks like it came from the set of an old Ridley Scott movie. Or maybe from the set of Hackers. Man, a million psychedelic colors. Yeah. Man, baby, sweet. Mm. I want it. I think these are awesome. I totally get the appeal. It's a sort of rebellion against the dull, uninspired conformity modern computer design has streamlined itself into. And you know what I mean, you get like the small rectangle, the larger rectangle, and the big rectangle with a hinge and a keyboard. Visually indistinguishable devices with no new ideas to offer, every new version just further eroding the user's agency in favor of a locked down 30% revenue share app store. Cyberdex to me are a way to wrestle back that agency, to return to a time where everything was still up in the air, where computers were weird and exciting, each one a new oddly shaped key that opens doors nobody has even encountered yet. To me, the dev term hits that very same nerve. It offers a taste of that but off the shelf if you can't be bothered whipping out the epoxy yourself. So I think that's the kind of person the dev term is for. It really needs that kind of user who just gets it, who likes the whole idea enough to be willing to make it work. And for that kind of person, yes, the dev term absolutely delivers. It totally is that tiny, quirky, retro coding laboratory, this cozy box of fun and creativity. For the people not on board with the idea, the dev term won't be doing much to change minds. The little annoyances are numerous and that kind of money probably is better spent on another big screen with a hinge and a keyboard. So yeah, that wraps it up. As an afterthought, um, I would like to make a wish. I would love to see a Clockwork Pi commit to the dev term this time around. Why would you offer those DIY devices if you don't also provide ways for users to upgrade these and customize them? I think the core units are a good start and I want to see more of that. I want to see more external boards. I want to see, you know, components that fix existing problems. How about a replacement unit for the keyboard with a trackball and controller buttons that don't suck? Or a replacement unit for the entire backplate with, you know, rubber feet and a battery flap that doesn't fall off. Maybe they will get it right this time. Would be nice. Fingers crossed. All right, so this is the dev term. This is my review of the dev term. If you enjoyed this video, you know the YouTube thing, like and subscribe and so forth. But also if you really enjoy my work, I have a Kofi page set up. You can even become a monthly subscriber and enjoy some special perks. At this point, special shout out to the Kofi crew. You guys know what I mean. So this is it for today. I have been Christian. See you next time around, guys. Bye bye.